We are in a series about prayer, and if you'll remember back, which I'm going to read it in just a few moments, that in Exodus chapter 3, Moses turns aside to see a great sight. The great sight was a burning bush. Now, bushes burn, but why it was a great sight was this bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And so he turned aside. He made it an intentional, conscious decision to go. And the, the reality is that the bush itself was already speaking to Moses. Just wasn't using words. That God was already starting to speak to Moses without formulating words. He eventually did. But there are things in this world that will speak to us long before there are words. So, listen, art, nature, whatever can be speaking to us long before we ever hear words. And that's what I want you to know as we continue to go into this series, as we go into this series, that God is speaking to you all around you, and then he wants to bring you into a place where he can share his words, where you can hear his heart, and you can share your heart with him. That's what he's looking to do. So if you have your Bibles, great. If you don't, look on with me. We're going to Exodus chapter 3, and we'll just kind of replay this moment of connection that Moses had with God before even words were spoken. Verse 3, and Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Now words. What are the first words that God speaks? Wasn't, hey, you. Wasn't, hey, what are you doing? Moses, Moses, God is so personal. He calls you by name. Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take off your sandals. Take the sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid. And then God continues to then open up in this prayerful dialogue who he is to Moses. And then he shares with Moses what he's asking Moses to do. We'll get to that in the, in, in the next couple of weeks. What I want to do right now is I want to focus in on two powerful realities, two powerful realities that prayer will reinforce in your life. Prayer, if you're willing to intentionally turn aside, to create a time, go to a space, and have conversation with God, two powerful realities will be reinforced. It will reinforce the fact that God is proximate. He's close. And it will also reinforce that God is intimate, that he wants to share his heart for you through this prayerful interaction. So we're going to look at those two things, proximity and intimacy. Proximity. There's a word in the Hebrew, and it's called paneum. Paneum. It's, it's the word proximity, but it's multidimensional. So this word paneum actually refers to both time and space time and space. And when the word paneum is, is referred to with God, it's saying that God is proximate in time. How so? He's proximate. He's close. The second, the split second before one of your moments, and he's present or he's close in the split second after. So basically what's happening is God is creating a parenthesis of time 
and he is hemming you in both the split second before and after every moment of your life. He's close in every aspect of your schedule, in your moments. The other thing that is happening is that God is also present in space. As it relates to God is present in space, it's saying that he is present, he is close, he is proximate, proximate right before you take a step and right after. So he's created a parenthesis of place and space. In other words, he is close no matter what direction you take. Which is really an amazing reality of God. And when you pray, God will, God will reinforce his closeness to you. See, too many people think God is so distant, that God is so out there, that God is, you know, he's AWOL. He's, he's, leave, he's, he's absent without leave. He's, he's gone walkabout. He hasn't. It's not in his nature. He is proximate. He is close. He's as close to you as your very own breath. He's hemmed you in. You know, when you walk around the streets of Joburg or you drive, you'll see, you'll see women who are walking and they've got their babies with their, with their blankets tied. And that little baby is like up against the back, you know? I mean, the baby's in a full-on split. I'm like, that baby is proximate. Mom is proximate with that baby. She's, she's in front of that baby, and that blanket is hemming that baby in. That's how God wants you to see yourself with him. I'm hemming you in behind and before. Look what, look what God says um, through David in one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 139. And before I go on to this, I want to ask you a question. David is going to pour out some incredible truth about this before and behind. He's going to pour out some incredible truths about God's closeness in proximity. And I want to ask you the question, how did he know this? Because this song, which what psalms are, many of them, this song was written by him. It didn't exist before. And probably at this time in the early Bronze Age where David was, you know, he was the deal, the king, the poet, the warrior... He probably only had the first five books of the Bible and maybe a few others. So how did he find out about this? How did he understand the proximity of God? How did he understand and experience and encounter the paneum of God in time and space? He was willing to turn aside. See, one of the things that God said about David is David is a man after my own heart. Didn't mean he had it perfectly down. He didn't. But it just meant he was a God. He, David was a man who pursued God, and he pursued him in his word, but he also pursued him in prayer. So the natives are restless. <laughs> this is what David says. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. When? Proximate in time. I know your every move. I know when you're going to sit and when you're going to rise. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. Before, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You wrap me up like an African woman with her baby. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I can't even attend it. So, so in David's prayerful relationship with God, he's, he's understanding God's incredible proximity 
in terms of his time that he spends every moment and whatever direction he goes. He gets it. And the beauty and the benefit of you and I having that proximity being reinforced does this for us. It reassures us that God never goes walk about with us. It reassures us and it gives us a security that when we feel kind of vulnerable and lost, he's hemmed us in. You get that? It's incredible. It's a beautiful reality of who God is. So God's proximity is not, it's never escapable. You cannot escape the closeness of God. You can't even avoid the closeness of God because it's in his nature to be close. You know, Marion and I have lived here for, it'll be nine years starting in, in September. Do you know one of the great things, and this, is, this isn't just me, this is many South Africans. We have family all around the world. Do you know how wonderful it is to know too wonderful for me to even fathom or attain. That as God has the two of us hemmed in, he's got our children and our grandson hemmed in. And we're separated by a mighty ocean. Do you know how reassuring that is? Where, yes, we have FaceTime and we can Skype and we've got technology, but to be proximate, to be close, to be in presence. We are not capable of that, but God is. Be reminded of that. And if you're willing to turn aside and to create a time and a space where you're praying, God is going to reinforce it. He's going to be speaking into your life to tell you, I'm with you. You can't escape me. The second word is a word that is, is a word that we find at the be very beginning of the Bible. And it's found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And it's the word hovering. So we go from paneum, proximity, to hovering. It says, the Spirit of God was hovering. The Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the deep waters. Before God even said anything, before words were spoken, which, by the way, the next verse, verse 3, God utters four words, and we saw it a couple weeks ago. Those four words were powerful because everything got going when he said, let there be light. And that's probably the sound that took place at creation. Just if you're thinking about it. What was the actual sound of creation? <laughs> before, there was, before there were even words of creation, the Spirit of God was hovering. Do you know what the Hebrew word for hovering means? It means a vibrating hum. The Spirit of God was humming. He was humming over before creation came to be. And he was humming a tune of, guess what? I'm creating a symphony of creation and nature, of stars and moon and planets and, I'm, and, and animals and plant life. And get ready because I'm humming over creation and there is going to be a symphony of my creative power that is going to be unleashed for everyone in the galaxy and in the universe to hear. God was hovering. Long before, long before the Spirit of God fills believers, seals believers, convicts, comforts, guides believers, the Spirit of God was humming he was hovering over creation. Do you know what that means? That means that the Spirit of God is still speaking. He's still humming over your life. He's still humming. And this vibrating symphony of bringing God's great 
resurrection power into your life. Do you know um, the other night, Wednesday night, we have our small group, and, um, and there was a person there. We always pray for each other. And there was a person there who really needed some extra prayer. This person was really struggling. They needed prayer for healing. So we kind of rallied around them. And, um, and the reason why I'm not telling you the names is because we have a rule in our small group. I, if you have a small group, I would adopt this rule if you don't already. And that is, the rule is this, what's said in small group stays in small group. And we protect each other and we give a safe parameter. So let me just say there was a person who was needing prayer for healing. So we all rallied around and we were praying. Never in my 40 years of knowing Jesus have I ever prayed a prayer that said hovering. I I was standing there and the Spirit of God whispered. I didn't hear audible words. And, and, you know, trust me, I don't hear voices. Um, but the Spirit of God in my heart just said, pray Genesis 1-2. Now, I actually knew what that was, but I was like, all right, I'll go with it. So I pray. And the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the deep waters. Now I'm trying to think, what's coming next? Because that's just weird. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit gave me the words. And I said, the Spirit of God is hovering over your life, and He wants to speak light into your darkness. The Spirit of God is hovering over your life right now, and He wants to bring order in the midst of the chaos that is going on in your body. And the Spirit of God wants to bring beauty out of the ashes of your pain. Now, I'm just not that smart. I'm not that clever. I'm not that good. But when you're in a relationship with God and you're praying, he whispers those kinds of things. And I'm here to tell you right now that the Spirit of God is hovering over you and I right now. Don't get freaked out. He's saying... I know what darkness is in your life, and I want to speak light into it. I know what chaos is in your life, relationally, professionally, whatever, financially, and I want to speak order into it. I am the Spirit of God, and I want to hum over your life, and I want you to hear my hum is a hum of beauty out of your ashes. See, isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? See, when you and I draw close to God, his proximity becomes so very real. And he wants us to encounter it, not just in our heads intellectually. He wants us to encounter it personally within our, the depths of our heart and our soul. So there's one more word in terms of proximity. And proximity, paneum, hovering, and this word is breath breath. Some Hebrew scholars have made a very strong case for the fact that the the name of God, the personal name of God, which God revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses goes, well, if you're sending me back to Pharaoh in Egypt, and they say, well, what God sent you, who, who will I say? Like, what's your name? What's your call sign? And God says, I am who I am. The Hebrew for this is so sacred that Orthodox Jews never even pronounce it. And it is the word Yahweh. And these Hebrew scholars have made a case for they feel that even the sound of that word Yahweh is actually synonymous with the sound of breath. If that's true, If that's true, the very first breath you take, the very last breath you take on this planet, and every breath in between, is your breathing in and breathing out the name of God. Yahweh. 
And then I started to think, which is a dangerous thing. My, my wife is, gets nervous when I think because I just start like, why don't we, hey, 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 hey. She's like, calm down there, Simba. Um, I started to think, do you know the last words of Jesus as recorded on the cross that he spoke in Luke? So Luke says this. Jesus' last words on the cross were, Father, I commit myself into your hands. Comma. And he breathed his last breath. I think the last word that Jesus said was, Yahweh. And you know what that means? I am. Just chew on that one for a while. There's great things happen when you go to prayer. And you know what I find, Christians? We, we love prayer, we talk about prayer, but we rarely do it. And if we do it, we come with our grocery list. And we're, God, can I have, can you, can you make it, can you, can you, can you, can you, can you, can you do, can you, and it's just like, that's great. He's willing to listen. He's a really big God. He'll listen to your grocery list. But at the end of the day, think about it. My children, I remember when they were teenagers, they, they were wonderful. And, I, and we had great communication with our kids. But there was a place when they were teenagers where I was like, I feel like an ATM. Does it say ATM on my forehead? Because they're just like, Dad, can I have? Dad, can I have? Dad, can I have? I need to go. Can I have it? I'm like, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And that's great, and I understood that. I'm their dad. And based on my relationship with them, I give it sometimes, and other times they're like, eh, no. You have money. You, you, if you save it, you can go for it. But I didn't want my relationship only to be about, Dad, can I have? You don't want your relationship to be, Father, can I have? You don't want that to be the sum total of your relationship. So proximity gives us this benefit of security and a reassurance that God is putting a parenthesis on your life and he's bracketing in you time and space. I'm with every moment of your schedule and I'm with you every step of the way. David goes on to say in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I were to go up to the sky, you're there. If I were to go down into the depths, you are there. If I were, if I were to rise on the wings of the dawn and I were to fly and settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand would find me and your right hand would hold me fast. Basically, he's saying, I can't go anywhere without you. And it's so reassuring and secure. The second thing that, that prayer does is it, it, it reinforces intimacy. Now, before I go on to talk about intimacy, because this word has literally been a, just redefined, obliterated, cut, sliced, diced by so many people that we don't really understand what intimacy is all about anymore. Let me just take you back to the beginning. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are in a perfect intimate relationship with one another. There is shared intimacy. There's shared mutual joy and love. They're that close. And they also really have experienced that they are, I'm in it for you. I'm in it for you. I'm, no, I'm in it for you. I'm in it for you. There's this intimacy that says we are in it with each other and for each other. And out of that, God creates man. Well, guess what? If we're created in God's image, you and I are created with a very strong wiring for intimacy. So if you crave intimacy, if you desire intimacy, well, well done, you just realize you're a part of the human race. We, we desire that. Nobody desires isolation. We desire intimacy. But if you seek intimacy 
apart from the one who made you, you're going to get a broken version of what that looks like. If you seek, if you seek and cultivate intimacy through God's word and through prayer, and you're coming into his presence, you're going to hear his words for you, and you're going to hear what he wants to reinforce about you and about the relationship. And that is far from being broken. It is absolutely pure and, and whole. But if you seek and you cultivate intimacy anywhere else, you're going to get a broken, twisted version of what intimacy looks like. Here's what I think. I think that people don't pursue intimacy with God in prayer, not because they can't find the time. That's just a lame excuse. You could find the time. I can find the time. It's not that we can't find a space where we we can find a quiet place somewhere in your life, somewhere in the places and spaces that you travel, you can find a quiet place. So that's a lame excuse. So it's not about our time and our space that keeps us pursuing intimacy. I think one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reasons, for not pursuing God in intimacy is you and I are afraid to hear what he might say to us. And Moses hid his face. Why? Because he's coming in contact with a very holy, holy God. So holy, it takes three holies. Holy, holy, holy. But then God reassures him. And then God says, let me tell you who I am. I'm the God of your fathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have framed your identity in relationship. See, we're afraid to hear what God might say to us because we've had broken versions of people speaking into our lives that hurt, that, 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 that pierce our souls. And you might have had a mother or a father who when you messed it up, they were there. Somebody was nagging. Somebody was shouting. Somebody was threatening. I'm here to tell you, if you want to know the beautiful intimacy of God and you get into prayer, in 40 years of me walking with God, 40, and believe me, there were many times where I completely stuffed it up. You know what I'm talking about, where, where you're like, I do the things that I shouldn't do, and I don't do the things that I should do. I feel like I'm in good company there. In 40 years of me having a track record of seeking God and wanting to be, when I stuff it up, I've never heard him nag, I've never heard him threaten, and I've never heard him shout at me. Ever. Do you know what I get? I get the tender voice of the Spirit of God going, Glenn, turn and come back to me. That's not healthy. Are you getting this? Song of Songs says this. God's mouth is sweetness itself. Meaning, his sweetness and his tenderness is actually for you. See, I think the reason why we turn a deaf ear and do not pursue God in intimacy is this. Not just because we don't want to hear what he has to say, but we do. That's true. And if that's you, here's what I want you to zero in on. You're not understanding. I want to say this with all grace and with all truth. You really don't understand the heart of God towards you. Because he's for you. We sang it. Our God is with us and our God is for us. 
Is that just a song or do you believe it? And so God is saying, I am there when you stuff it up and I will bring you back in tenderness. Paul says it this way to the Roman church. He goes, listen, even when you've messed it up, God's kindness is drawing you back. This is what Paul says. His kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. His kindness, not his threats, not his nagging, and not his shouting, not his finger pointing. His kindness and the sweetness of his mouth. Come back. Come back. The other thing about intimacy that I want you to see is... Um, there are 12 official languages in South Africa, and I don't know any of them. I don't even know the English part, because even that's different. Water, water. <laughs> banana, banana. I get that. So here's the deal. Whatever language you speak, God knows your language. And not only does he know your language, he has custom fitted his voice and his dialect to you. Did you ever think about that? God has a dialect. He has a, he speaks Glen. There are many languages in this world, but there are billions and billions of people and he speaks every dialect for every person. He's custom fitted. Listen to this verse. It, Psalm 29, verse 4, one translation says this, the voice of the Lord is fitted to the strength of you. That means, translation, God speaks your language. God speaks your language. And he speaks every dialect. It's a and fitted, and if you're willing to turn aside, if you're willing to get proximate and close with him as he hemmed you and I in, and you start to hear God wanting to share his heart with you, you will hear his dialect with you and for you. I have a, um, we have friends in Atlanta, Georgia, and, um, and the woman has a congenital um, hearing problem, and it's, and it's continuing to go down. And there will be a day where she, they're friends of ours, and she will be completely deaf. And um, she goes to the audiologist regularly. And um, I don't ever forget this one time, we were having dinner, and we said, how's it going? She said, well, we got some bad news. And um, she said that I've had significant hearing loss in several different frequencies and ranges of my hearing. And then her husband said, but tell him the great news. The audiologist said, you've had significant loss in all these different ranges, but you have one frequency in which you have perfect hearing. It's the frequency of your husband's voice. Custom fit. She can hear his voice perfectly. See, when we start to get in prayer, we have to, it's like learning a new language. If you've ever tried to learn a new language, uh, you, you have to immerse yourself. You can't just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do Rosetta Stone on, on Wednesday and then on Friday. You could do that. You'll, you'll learn some vocabulary. But if you really want to get conversational, you've got to immerse yourself in the language. I'm telling you, we've got to immerse ourselves in the language of prayer. And then when we do, God will be right at your frequency and he will, custom, he will custom fit his voice for your dialect for hearing so that you're right at the right frequency. And guess what? You have to do as language requires immersion, dialect re requires repetition. 
You've got to continue to do this. You will not hear the voice of God if you just kind of do it here, there, and everywhere. It needs to be immersing yourself into turning aside and praying so that you can actually get intimate with God and you can hear his heart toward you. And what you will hear will be things like this as I close in Isaiah 43. This is what God is saying to his people. This is also, you're getting two of my biggest and my most favorite chapters in the Bible. So if you're here as a guest, you, you just, you just got to really take it all in because you're getting my favorites right here. This is God saying to his people, now thus says the Lord, he's saying this through the prophet Isaiah, sorry, Isaiah, <laughs> he who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, fear not, the most repeated command in Bible. Fear not. Why? Because we get afraid. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. Redeemed you says, I've rescued you. I am protecting you. I will constantly be with you. And my promises will be fulfilled in your life so that you might flourish with me. That's a big word in Scripture. Fear not, for I've redeemed you. And then he says this, I have called you by name. You are mine. Are you? I, you know what that means? That means belonging. I belong to the God of the universe. I belong. You belong. If you've entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you belong. And he says, you're mine. And nothing, as Simon said, and nothing or no one can ever get in between and separate us from the love of God. No one can pry their way in. No one can weasel their way in. We, 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 no, God has got us hemmed in behind and before. And then once we're in the parentheses of his time and space, guess what? He's there to tell you. You are precious. Look what he goes on to say. Just wait. He goes on to say this. When you pass, so you're going to face hardships. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. God's saying, I'm present in every one of your hardships. I don't leave when the, t when the tough get going. Or when the times get tough. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. There is no other. Then he says this, I give Egypt as your ransom. So he's going all the way back to Moses. I give Egypt as your ransom. Do you know what he's saying? He goes, God is saying this for you. Those who he calls by name and those he says are mine. He goes, I will move a king's heart and I will move a kingdom. I will even move history for your sake. And that's what he did at the cross. He goes, for your sake, I'm moving your eternal history, and my son will do it. Because you are, why? Because you're precious in my eyes. Do you know how many people are desperate to hear that? That God is saying, I want you to know my heart for you. I can tell you every day. You're precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Drop the mic. Can you stand?